Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent as they may disrupt the um, broadcasting? Uh, uh, today's meeting is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's proposals for a Scottish Social Security Commission, and I welcome a uh, sorry. I've actually got a first agenda item, which is to agree to take item three in private. Does the committee agree to that? Yeah. Yeah, so. uh, and agenda item two is to welcome um, to uh, committee this morning uh, Dr Jim McCormick and Judith Patterson. Dr McCormick is chair of the, um, the Disability Carers Benefit Expert Advisory Group and Judith Patterson was the chair of the work screen on the scrutiny work that was undertaken by that commission. Um, so we um, welcome you both to committee this morning, uh, uh, particularly as it was relatively short notice. So um, we're very glad to see you this morning. And uh, as uh, an introductory question, could I just ask, um, in, in your document, you recommend that the size of the commission um, would be around the five number, not a definite number, but around five commissioners. Um, do you think that will give enough um, breadth and expert, breadth of knowledge and expertise within the Commission to fulfil the functions as required? Uh, good morning, convener, committee members. Um, so I guess today the, there's the, <clears throat> the findings and recommendations of our work stream, which Judith mm -hmm. chaired, and then we've got, as of last week, the Scottish Government amendments and indeed other amendments from, 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 from members. Um, on the size of the proposed commission, um, the proposal to have a chair plus maximum for other members is a government amendment rather than a work stream conclusion. We didn't take a view on the size of the commission, but I would offer one thought, which is it strikes us that this commission, when established, will have different phases to its work. And certainly for the duration of this parliament, when it's in set up mode and is taking regulations for assistance um, uh, uh, upstream in, in a sense, so quite a lot of intense activity, it might be that that number is too small. So it might be that we need to have the flexibility of a core membership, but also be able to draw routinely upon committee or subcommittee members in a way that wouldn't be true perhaps in steady state further down track when there are fewer regulations coming in a typical parliamentary year. So um, uh, I think we've got an open mind about that, but we're not sure that there's a simple answer, even though the bill will require um, some clarity and pre precision on, on, on that point. Just to add to that, it's useful that the amendments does provide for there to be the core membership of the Commission plus a, a wider, more flexible membership. So uh, I think I would expect that a Commission would have to, to draw upon that flexibility. Thank you. Um, Mr Tompkins <coughs> wanted to come on. Okay. Mina, um, good, mo good morning. I just wanted to ask whether in general terms you thought that the Government amendments um, met the recommendations, satisfied the recommendations of your report? Do you want to go first? I, I would say that our sort of core advice um, was that there did indeed there need to be um, an independent scrutiny body to provide that independent assurance of how policy is translated into, into workable legislation and to, to drive the learning and improvement that's needed in the system. And on those primary functions, yes, we've, we, we see in the amendment that there will be a scrutiny body which will be statutory, which will provide scrutiny of regulations as well as oversight via charter um, principles. And th those core functions are absolutely in, in line with what the body recommended. Uh, I think in terms of wider issues, some things are left more open, more flexible, and I, and I think, or just more open. And so that I think there's decisions and conversations still to be had down the line about, about exactly what that ends up looking like. I'll just add, add to that that um, the, there's both provision for ministers and parliament to um, request this commission to advise and report on various themes, but there's also a general powers provision, which I think is quite important, which would allow for 
a commission that is there to be independent, um, to have discretion and to be able to proactively report uh, both when requested but also when it, when it uh, chooses to, when it sees a reason to make a particular report. So broadly, uh, we think the functions and recommendations that we outlined in our report have been addressed fairly thoroughly. There are particular points, as Judith says, that remain um, uh, uh, more open, but some of that is probably okay in terms of how the Commission would want to um, operate. So I, I think there aren't very many red flags, if you like, in the amendments that we've seen thus far. Uh, for me, and I think indeed um, for the whole committee, given what we said in our stage one um, report on the Social Security Bill, um, what's really important about this is that the Commission is independent, that the Commission's recommendations are in public, and that ministers have to give reasons in the event that they disagree with or want to depart from any of the recommendations of the Commission, and that seems to be all to be in the government amendment and is therefore to be welcomed. But what would you say to a challenge that um, in terms of the making of substantive social security law in Scotland, these amendments will make an unelected commission more powerful than elected MSPs? Uh, I think I would like to just really highlight the very different roles that, these, that the Commission has compared to the, the role that the, the Parliament and this committee has. So the, the, the role of a Commission is, is to not try and challenge government policy. It's to, it's to really provide assurance that that policy has been arrived at in the way that it should have been, that options have been considered, <coughs> that... Um, that the impacts have been considered on various groups, that the delivery challenges have been explored. Um, so it's not challenging the policy itself. And of course, Parliament can do all those things, but Parliament can do much more, which is to, to hold government to account for the, 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 the policies that it said it was going to deliver, has it delivered them, and for its own views on, on whether those policies are right or wrong. So they're, they're really very separate, I, I, I'd say. So for this to work, the the Commission has to complement the work of Parliament. And I, I, th I think um, we might want to talk about the enhanced scrutiny that, um, that comes along with, with that. And I can see that the amendment um, leaves it rather open for Parliament, for this committee, to decide what kind of um, enhanced scrutiny it wants to to, to bring to bear on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think there's an argument for saying that very case-by-case -case nature could be a strength, that the super-affirmative isn't pinned down in the bill. But I think there is, there is, there's issues there for Parliament to consider about where it, it really does get to make a difference. Thank you. I mean, we, you know, obviously, through, throughout the whole of the process of our... Um, scrutiny of this bill, we've been thinking quite hard about the relationship between primary and secondary lawmaking powers. I think we now also have to think about the relationship between the powers and functions of the Parliament in making law and the powers and functions of external advisers, such as the proposed commission in, in making law, because it is a lawmaking function that the commission is, is, go, is going to have. Um, and that leads me to my final question about this, which is that the one thing in your report that really jarred with me um, it was the recommendation that, as well as having a role in advising on lawmaking, which is a role I f fully support, um, the Commission should also have a role in scrutinising and in, uh, almost kind of enforcing or investigating complaints about the Charter. And that, that seemed to me to be um, not, appro not appropriate, actually. It seems to me that you know, playing a role, a, a very important role, in... The, in, in, the, in the making of regulations is a very different function indeed from ensuring um, that those regulations are then implemented properly in accordance with the principles, in accordance with the Charter. And, and I, I will not be supporting any government amendment that seeks to blur those two functions, because I think it's actually quite an important constitutional point in terms of the separation of powers, that you know, th those who are involved directly or indirectly in the lawmaking process should not be involved in, as it were, policing or enforcing or investigating complaints about how those laws are then uh, Im implemented. So I just wondered if you could um, r respond to that. Um, 
So we approached um, all these questions with, with completely open mind and there were different opinions to start with in our work stream on this and other points. I think as we, uh, so there's, a, there's an immediate distinction to draw here between um, complaints which take the pathway of individual redress and colleagues from SPSO next will have a lot to say about that. Um, that's a separate pathway from, from what we envisage this body might do. And, and when we talk about oversight, I guess uh, it's trying to spot um, how is the system performing as a whole um, against the principles in the bill and how that those get expressed in the charter. Um, and we were not persuaded in the end that when you add up the existing functions of SPSO, Audit Scotland, possibly others, um, that there's a distinctive and specialist spotlight on performance of, of the system. Now, clearly, those other bodies will have particular lenses on how the system is performing, so value for money, complaints, and so on. But in terms of um, uh, you know, broadly performance of the system um, against what it's there to do, at a systemic level, um, we think someone has to perform that oversight function independently. Um, uh, we're not sure that other bodies can do it currently. It's possible their remits could be expanded. Um, so we thought there was still a question to be answered. And we thought probably it is consistent to bring together these roles in one body to make it proportionate and viable. And so we concluded that they could sit together, but of course that would have to be tested. And that's why we also proposed a review clause to see how these functions are being exercised and how they sit with other bodies and also with parliament. Thank you. Um, Mr. Balfour, you put your hand up. Is that a supplementary on that area? Yeah, yeah. Both of those, yep. Yeah. Uh, I just would like to follow both those comments up and maybe just start with where you just come from. I mean, I suppose, having looked at the government amendments and looked at your report, there does seem to be a slight blurring of what is the function of um, the new independent commission, whatever name we want to give it, and the role of this committee. Uh, and going back to the point made by um, Adam Tompkins, you are very much, the new commission will very much have a role of scrutinising, uh, commenting on legislation. You don't think you become then judge and jury in regard to if you take on the investigation role as well? <coughs> and is that not a role either for this committee to do, if it's looking at the kind of oversight of how it's all going, rather than an independent commission? Uh, and my second question, just going back to um, Judith Patterson's remarks, if I could, in regard to having a flexibility within super affirmative that is within... I read it slightly differently. It seems to me that as the amendments are drafted at the moment, the power of the minister and of the commission seem to be far greater than that of this committee to decide how they want to deal with future regulations. And again, I, I would just wonder if you can maybe unpack a bit more how you feel the balance is right between, if you like, the executive and a commission and the parliament, which clearly is going to have a triangular important role, but I just wonder, I suppose put my cards on the table, I think the power maybe has gone too much to two of the three groups, and I've been just to get a few more comments on that. I, I, th I think in terms of the enhanced scrutiny and the relative roles of the Commission and, 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 and Parliament, it might be useful to say a little bit about this, this sequencing of, of the scrutiny. So. My understanding is that um, governments will make proposals public to the Commission, to Parliament, to the, to, to the, to, to the public at the same time. Um, so at the, there can be a concurrent scrutiny um, of the Commission and Parliament with access to the same information. 
Um, the Commission then provides a report which is in public, its, its views on, on things like impact and delivery challenges and options, human rights, equalities. And when that report is, is laid, there's also another intervention point for Parliament, for this committee, to have access to that um, thinking. And it, the next stage is that regulations are actually laid by government at the same time as the government's response to the Commission's report. And the timing of that, I think, will be quite important for Parliament to consider whether that timing, which you're right to say, is not within Parliament or this committee's control, nor is it within the control of the Commission, its government holds that timing, and whether that provides sufficient time and space for Parliament to have the access to full information and to give full scrutiny to the provisions. So I think it's, it's that sequencing and timing that might be critical here. Um, and, and I guess culture and practice might make all the difference in this, in this respect. On a practical level, where do you see the time where uh, either members of the public or third-party charities, interested groups, have the opportunity to then lay their evidence before... In that sequence, would you see that evidence predominantly going to the Commission or rather than the Parliament? I... I I think um, the Commission would want to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether it felt it was necessary to go out and seek that, those kind of views and, and, and have that public consultation. There would be nothing to stop people submitting their views anyway because the proposals are well known. Um, but some, some regulations will be complex and controversial and others will be very straightforward. Um, so in terms of what Parliament does, Yes, I, I think there is the potential for confusion if Parliament also chose um, to have a, a consultation process that was running at the same time. Um, so I think there would be need, need for bodies to work together to make sure that external um, parties knew exactly how their contributions would be most effective. Um, can I bring in Ms McNeill? I think that I think what you've just been talking about, Judith, is the nub of the matter for me. And I think this confusion needs to be cleared up forthwith because, um, yeah, and, and I agree with you. I think the timing is absolutely, I mean, it's absolutely uh, the case, as far as I'm concerned, that the Parliament would want to consult. And I think you would make that assumption. So I think this needs to be resolved. I mean, I wonder if, you, if, if you'd had any discussions with ministers about the timing of this. I mean, my understand, I'm trying to get an understanding of this. So the role of the Commission, is, I suppose in essence, is, is to provide the expertise on regulations. And it's that informative aspect of it that's informative for the public, for ministers and for the Parliament. But what do you envisage then, at what stage then, when the Parliament makes its views, would it then be able to use that expert advice? and get the, the regulations amended accordingly? Um, and should I, that not be clearer? Should it not be set out a bit clearer then, given that you've said that there would be confusion over this? But I think we haven't had discussion with, with right. ministers on, on this, this point. As, uh, we, as a work stream, when we were uh, consulting with people, um, including the Delegated Powers and Law Reform, committee, we, we simply took a view that um, there was no reason why the scrutiny that the Commission performed couldn't sit alongside uh, a super-affirmative process, but we didn't take a view on what that super-affirmative process should be, merely that it did, the sequencing was important and the timing was important. Um, so I, I suppose we haven't gone any further than, than, than that, but I, I, I think you're, you're right to identify um, how the bodies work together as, as being a very important part of this. I've got a few other uh, <coughs> questions on different areas. It's different areas. I've got other um, people to come in. We'll move on to that, Pauline. Um, uh, Mr Griffin, was yours a supplementary on what's been discussed? I'll bring you in at the moment then. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I, mean, I think the reason we got to this point was because there was a concern within the committee and out with the committee that the 
the, the balance in favour of secondary legislation could lead to a situation where uh, the committee could well agree with 99% um, of what was tabled by the government and could have issue with just a small aspect which could lead to the whole um, set of regulations being rejected. And I, I guess it comes down to that that issue of the, the sequencing and, and timing. Just what role do you see for uh, the committee and, and parliament in interacting with the work that you do? Would you be um, seeking the views of uh, the committee in, in advance of uh, preparing a report, or do you see the, the commission's role as, as purely um, to advise the committee rather than seeking any views? Um, ministers will give their own version of this. Our um, understanding is government wishes to draft a set of amendments which would allow for this committee and the whole parliament indeed to be able to make its own choices, as Judith said, case by case, depending on the type of regulations, um, as to where you choose to kind of be involved um, and to what degree. I, I think it's quite important this committee does um, uh, ask quite searching questions to get assurance on this point, because I think the ideal would be that you, you and others in the parliament get expert input and assurance, or not, as the case may be, depending on the regulations. Um, in a timely way that allows you to uh, perform the function you want to perform um, and not run out of time or not get a commission report too late um, or not find regulations late and you have to it, it, it's take it or leave it. So, th so having, having some space, once the commission has reported on regulations, um, um, knowing what the government's response to that is, but before the regulations are firmly laid, that would be the ideal. That would give us a position we currently don't have with Westminster and, and the other advisory bodies. Um, so I, I think it's quite important as far as possible um, that space is created and preserved um, in order for your role, the role of parliamentarians, the role of the Commission to be genuinely complementary um, and to clear up um, concerns about confusion and duplication. For me, this should all be about giving assurance to ministers in Parliament or challenging where appropriate. It shouldn't be about trying to usurp or duplicate or make things more complex than they already will be. Um, just to uh, add to that in terms of who does what when one of the um, amendments it's uh, amendment 55 paragraph 7 does allow um, ministers to lay regulations without giving a response to the commission's report so just to draw attention to that it might be something you want to explore with ministers about how they think that that might that power might be used it looks like something where they think a provision is urgent and needs to be expedited, allows government to do that. Um, the committee might want to explore where it sits with that kind of urgency provision. Yeah, uh, Mr McPherson. Okay, just for clarity, in, in the context of what's been said about expert input, giving assurance and, and being complementary, uh, is my understanding that this committee and parliament will also be able to request the Commission to look into things. That's the case, isn't it? Yes, okay. yes. There's, there's explicit um, provision for both Ministers and Parliament to re re request advice from the Commission, essentially. Yes. Um, may I ask a, another question as well? Can Is we, it on this area? Um, slightly I'd rather we move on to the other then. areas and we will come, okay. I will come Thank back you. to you. Um, can I bring in Alison Johnson? Mr. Thank Mr. you, convener. Um, thank you. I think Judith Patterson just sort of touched on this area, but last year controversial changes were made to PIP um, to undo the impact of a tribunal decision without 
consulting the UK Social Security Advisory Committee. Um, given that, and I'm, I'm quoting the SPICE briefing that we've received for this meeting, draft regulations could be laid before the Commission had reported, mm -hmm. could the Commission here be bypassed in a similar way? Um, one of the things that um, our work stream report recommended was that all regulations should be put to the Commission and there shouldn't be exceptions to that, are there, as there are with UK SAC. So with the UK SAC, um, UK government um, does have that urgency provision to lay regulations without coming to SAC. Now, th this amendment doesn't allow that to happen, in, in fact. So um, if, if that were to happen again with those PIP changes, um, the government would have to put the proposals to the Commission before the, um, the regulations were laid. It couldn't happen the other way around. So the urgency that's built into these amendments in Scotland is that the proposals would come to the Commission, the Commission would report, but the Commission might not have time to report before the amendments are, are laid. So it, it, it's, it's not the same, there's, 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 it's not as bad, if you like, as the UK provision. So it couldn't happen in that way. And just, just, just for context, I think it's worth reflecting on, on, in the case that you mentioned around PIP and uh, the judge's decision on that, um, the UK government's uh, decision not to consult on the changes because they, they had done previously some years earlier um, consultation in the prime legislation was, was not taken as, as a very strong argument. So that was one of the main weaknesses and one of the main reasons that led to that judgment. So I think you've identified a really significant point about, yes, there's, there's, there should be ample scope for thorough and rigorous scrutiny during primary legislation debate, um, but that doesn't get away from the need for uh, scrutiny and, where appropriate, thorough consultation around at least some of the regulations as well. Um, there may be also uh, times when guidance is so significant <laughs> that it needs to be given its its own um, uh, uh, dedicated scrutiny as well. So there, there, uh, we think that um, the amendments broadly allow for us to be in a better place in Scotland, um, but I think it is definitely worth the, this committee asking government about um, how it sees, um, uh, does it see any exceptions? Um, as we understand that the only exceptions broadly are when, when secondary legislation is being consolidated. So it's already been round the loop, if you like. Um, uh, but it would be worth, I think, uh, asking more about that point of ministers. On that question of, of exceptions, regulations relating to determination of entitlement, the creation of new criminal offences and other issues, appear not to be, you know, open for scrutiny by the Commission. I mean, do you have any reservations about those exceptions? I think I would have to get back to you on, on that point. I'm, I'm not very clear myself whether that's the case. I think I, I had thought that all social security regulations would be subject to <laughs> scrutiny by the Commission, um, but I'll have a look into that. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Adam, you had uh, something to mention? Uh, good morning. Uh, I would just like to follow on from something Ben McPherson mentioned earlier on. And I think it gets enough, because I'm not buying into the, the this creates the Commission or the Ministers are more powerful than the Parliament itself. You know, I'm just not buying that malarkey. But the, the whole idea I'm saying here is the fact that, as Mr McPherson says, we could actually commission as a committee, some, get them to do some work for on behalf of us, as you said earlier on. And does that not just add to the fact that, you know, we've got that further scrutiny then, because Parliament effectively is guiding it from that perspective as well, if we're proactive as a committee? So I, I think um, that that provision in the bill would give a clearer relationship to Parliament as well as to ministers um, than, in effect, we've got at Westminster. So that would be um, giving more assurance, I think, um, about the legitimate role of, of Parliament. 
Um, I think what's important is that Parliament feels able to use that ability to draw upon advice um, at the right time. Um, and I think when you consider the the nature of Social Security, uh, it's complex. <laughs> uh, there are interactions with UK, obviously. Um, it's broadly it's startup activity at speed. So um, th this ought to be a form of expert assurance that can be drawn upon as appropriate. Um, and, and a point that Judith made a lot in the, in the work stream is, I mean, getting the bill and the amendments right is really important, but getting the culture and relationships right is really what will make this work or not. Um, and and that will be down to, you know, whoever's on the commission and how they interpret um, uh, alongside government and parliament these relationships. So um, uh, we, we, that's what we have found as, as SAC members, being able to be... Um, challenging but also have a constructive relationship uh, with different bodies is tricky but really that's the space we should be aiming for with this okay thank you thank you uh, Ms. McNeil, do you want to come in on the points you had yep um so ministers should be able to seek advice but not require such advice um but the According to our note, the proposals would um, allow ministers to direct the commission. I just wondered if you could speak, speak to that. I think the, the, the functions of the commission uh, includes, I, I think, in the same terms that, that um, uh, both ministers and, and parliament can request that the commission reports um, on any matter. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I think in, in my mind, I, th I think the independence of the Commission is absolutely critical um, in, for people to have trust in it. It's, it, it needs to, to be independent to do its job. And I think you're right to highlight the ability of both Ministers and Parliament actually to request that advice. Is that a request that has to be um, um, delivered, or is it, or does the, the commission have a, a, the ability to say no? Um, and I think, as Jim said, it's, that's probably not something that you need to fix, pin down in legislation. It is about culture, and we've got. A, a chance in Scotland because we're setting this up from scratch and we're building relationships from scratch to set the tone and get the culture right from the beginning and to make sure that the the Commission is able to give its expert input in the most helpful way to both Parliament and Ministers and not get tugged in directions that are actually unhelpful which I, I think potentially could could happen because the bill is written in, in a fairly open way. You, you would be concerned if um, the provision, the functions in the, of the bill um, were designed to direct the Commission to undertake work that would concern you? Because it would I, remove its independence? I think it would depend. Um, I, I think the primary duties of the Commission are to scrutinise the legislative proposals, first and foremost, and the, the sort of strategic oversight of, of, of system as well. And with a small commission and proportionate resource, um, how much is then left over to provide uh, uh, advice? Uh, I, I think it, we won't know until we're there. Um, so I, I think my concern would be if there were requests coming that, that couldn't be delivered because of resource or shouldn't be delivered because it was compromising independence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Convener. I just wanted to get back to uh, the, the scrutinising function of, of the, the Commission and just inquire about how the, the new scrutiny body would ensure that the Scottish Government is independently held to account for delivering on the commitment uh, within the principles and uh, more widely of approaching Social Security differently 
and, and it's delivered currently, and that the system fulfils people's human rights by treating them with dignity and respect. So a great, a great deal of um, how that your question gets answered, I think, lies in uh, what the Charter looks like, how it how well it expresses the principles of the Bill, um, and how clearly understood and communicated the Charter is. Um, in, in reality, I think we want to have a system and an agency and a Charter that does a really good job consistently in making sure decisions are right, first time upstream, that where things go wrong, and things will go wrong in every bit of the system, that's just the nature of the system, but when things do go wrong, um, there is local and rapid resolution. And as, as um, we minimise unnecessary <coughs> escalation, so we, we, we try and locate responsibility for resolving things at the right point in the system. Um, there will be, um, one would imagine, a really clear route to um, uh, requesting redeterminations, to appeals to the tribunal service, separately to individual complaints, um, uh, and we'll hear more about that in the next session. Um, so as far as possible, when people have problems either about their treatment, so procedurally, the outcome, the rate of payment or mistakes being made. We want people to know quickly how those should be fixed, to be supported. Uh, there have been quite a lot of discussion around supporter roles around the bill. Um, and only to have, need to have recourse to more formal procedures and escalation where, where that's appropriate and where necessary and to make sure that's done in a timely way. Um, so, codifying this, articulating this in the Charter, I think is the single biggest task that lies ahead of us um, to, get, to get this right in most cases. Absolutely. And uh, that's a collective responsibility. Uh, say, I think it's, it's important for us all to recognise that the the Commission's role in, in order to assist with the, the, the delivery on the requirements of human rights. And uh, thank you for that input. Thank you. Um, are there any, M Mr Griffin? Yeah. <coughs> I have a question, just to ask if you think the Commission should have any role in terms of oversight with any guidance the government produces? Y yes. Uh, <coughs> People did tell us that they, they, they thought that there should be uh, a role in terms of scrutinising guidance and the reason for that is, is that it generally in the social security system, not just the, 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 the Scottish devolved benefits, more and more is left to discretion rather than in uh, uh, acts or, or regulations and that discretion is governed by guidance. And sometimes that guidance can be just as important as the regulations themselves. So are, are very much deserving of scrutiny to make sure that the guidance works as well as it should for people. Um, so it, it, you'll have seen in the amendments there's no formal role built in um, for guidance. Uh, but looking at it, it seems to me neither is it precluded. And it might be that that's something that, that um, this committee uh, might want to keep an eye on um, as, as guidance emerges, that if government aren't asking the Commission to look at guidance and the Commission isn't of its own volition doing it or able to do it, they could use the power to request um, advice on something to kind of make that happen. So I, I do think it's not necessarily something that you need to build in as a primary function in legislation, but it's something that I think the Commission could provide a very useful, um, possibly even necessary role in. But all that, all, all that is, is predicated by it has to be proportionate because there can be guide, there's guidance on absolutely everything. So it would need to be guidance of, of the kind of order that's kind of substituting for regulations, if you like. It's, it's, it's making this, make, it's driving the rules. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions from the committee? 
Um, can I, I thank both Dr McCormick and Judith Patterson for their attendance this morning. If you could get back to the committee regarding the issues um, raised by Ms Johnson, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, and indeed, if you feel that you want to give any further information to the committee, please feel free to, to um, write to us um, with that information. But thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Next witness, witness panel, uh, um, we want to welcome to committee this morning. Again, we really appreciate you coming this morning. Uh, Rosemary Agnew, the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. Nikki McLean, Director. And John Stevenson, who is Head of Improvement, Engagement and Standards, Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. So um, a very warm welcome to committee this morning. Um, as I know, just to, to set the tone, can, can you give us a, an indication of what discussions you've had with the Scottish Government about handling complaints re related to the Charter and the broader decision-making standards in this social security system? Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for inviting us. Um, we've had discussions, obviously, about the need for who handles complaints, what legislation is required in order to introduce that and ensure that complaints are handled at the appropriate time in the right way. But we've also spoken with them about the wider issue of learning from complaints for improvement and the role that complaints themselves have in terms of scrutiny. Because if all you ever do is answer individual complaints, nothing much ever changes. And because this is new legislation, and this is not just new, this is fairly fundamental in the sense that it is an opportunity to do something different in a different way. Um, and for me, and the point that we have consistently made is legislation is important, standards are important, but what we actually need to do is keep sight of the person. And that becomes important in the context of complaints because we're talking about the individuals needing assistance who are likely to be at a very stressful time, a most vulnerable time, and we need to try and keep it as simple and straightforward as we can for them. So in terms of our discussions with um, government, we have considered the proposed changes in terms of should there be a, a complaints process in relation to rights. Um, and we have discussed with them um, concepts of oversight because there are other issues that flow out of complaints. We learn lots of things. What do we do with what we learn? What do we do with the information that we identify about systemic issues because they are likely to be the things that give an indication of how well the charter and therefore how well the act itself is working. So in that context, our discussions have also included information sharing. And we think it's crucial that we are able to share information um, with the commission. Um, and I'll perhaps pick up on why I think that's so important later. Um, we also think it's crucial that we are able to get access to DWP information. Um, and this is uh, largely drawn on our experience of um, the reviewer for the Scottish Welfare Fund. Time is critical when it comes to assistance. Um, I'm conscious that there are complex complaints that come to us 
that can take a year to look at, not because anybody is doing anything wrong, but they are so complex. With complaints about assistance, like reviews of the welfare fund, they have to be done virtually in real time because somebody is depending on money. So the information sharing, which is the other area we've talked about, is also crucial in terms of complaint and oversight. Um, the one other thing that the committee might want to consider, um, we focused on information sharing between ourselves, government, DWP, and the commission. But when you look at the breadth of what a charter will look at in terms of rights, there are likely to be other organisations in the public sector who will also have information that tells you about how those rights are working in practice. So the context in which um, uh, information can be made available to look at systemic issues becomes very important. And this perhaps brings me to a, a, a comment about the Commission itself. Um, I'm I've picked up from this morning, they were talking, this idea of can you look at complaints about the Charter? Can you look at complaints about rights? And um, should you have an oversight function? And I think to an extent the semantics are getting in the way here. Um, and that is, if we think of it from the perspective of a service user, somebody who wants assistance, they apply for it, they don't get what they have applied for, there is an appeal tribunal route in terms of the actual decision on their um, money. But what happens if in the process of that, um, you know, officers are busy, we all have bad days, they're rude to them, they don't respond to correspondence, they don't take account of essential information because uh, something in the post room went wrong. Those are service issues and they will come to the SPSO. Um, but from the individual's perspective, they're not going to say, or are unlikely to say, you breached my right under the Charter. They're likely to come and say, I, I didn't get my money in time, and it's because of delay and because of this. And that's why the SPSO is important, because everything comes back to the Charter. The, I, I completely agree um, with Jim McCormick. The wording of that charter is crucial because what flows from that are processes, procedures, timescales, uh, policies, and what they should be doing is embedding the charter into the day-to-day -day delivery of assistance. The average person should not need to know that I have a right to this, I have a right to that. They have a right to benefit and they have a right to a good service and they have a right to be um, treated like um, a human being with respect and dignity. And if that is embedded in the way the service is delivered, then that charter is met. Now, if the service is not delivered in the way that those policies, procedures are, are um, implemented, or even written, then we're likely to pick that up at an individual level. And so, almost by definition, if there is maladministration in the delivery of the service, there should be a way of translating that back over a period of time to whether there are systemic issues or even personal um, things about the way individuals are treated. And used in that way, the Charter almost becomes a set of service standards uh, in, in the way that we would look at complaints. And that's very much in keeping with the complaints <coughs> process anyway. What this leads us to is, it may well be that a particular individual applies for a couple of um, types of different assistance, and they get the money that they've been entitled to, but it's a, a long drawn out process. One would hope not, but worst case scenario. Um, the complaint to us may well be, I applied for this benefit and I applied for this assistance and whilst ultimately I got what I was entitled to, the experience was appalling and it was awful. 
we, we monitor those over time. We do that with complaints now. And in fact, what we find is that well over half of the recommendations we make are about service-based issues, about service improvement. And for a new function, service improvement is even more critical because it's telling us how well that service is being designed and bedded in. Um, Jim earlier said, it won't go perfectly. It won't go perfectly from the start, but what we have to do is ensure we've got a way of picking that up quickly. So then what do we do with this? Well, this is where I come back to the point about, I think semantics have got in the way, because there is a difference between oversight of the effectiveness of a charter and complaints about the charter. Complaints will be predominantly about service. But there will be other groups, um, it may well be an advocacy group, um, a third sector group, who find through their, um, their uh, stakeholders and users that there seem to be flaws in aspects of certain bits of the charter. And that is not so much about complaints about it, but concerns, comments and issues. And I think it's important that the Commission are able to take those and look at those in a more abstract and holistic way. Um, and I, I use the example of we uh, gather information from our complaints about health. And we are part of the intelligence bit, the Health Improvement Scotland, and we share this so that there can be a holistic look at that sort of performance. But for um, social security, that doesn't exist now. So we, in a way, need to create that. So if we're sharing our intelligence with the Commission, and they also have the powers to look at other concerns, that would give, a, I think, a very good basis for A, challenging, but more importantly, improving, feeding back to this committee and to ministers, but it also gives you a different lens through which to look at regulation. So when you're considering new regulations, I'll, I'll leave aside all the debates about space and time, and if, if purely in terms of a regulation that's going in, ah, actually, the experience that we're having fed back to us is this, this, and this, and we think this regulation will either fix it or not. So I guess what I'm saying is, I think by having an SPSO complaints process, by having a commission that has the ability to look at concerns and wider issues, but not necessarily couched in terms of complaint. What you build is a way of looking both at wider and particular and a bridge between them. And the feedback route then is about um, the scrutiny and the, the development of regulations and performance over time. And some of this won't come out for, you know, six months, possibly longer, in, in terms of whether these issues emerge. But my experience, <coughs> excuse me, of having been in organisations where new regulation comes in is you're probably better with less detail than more, because as soon as there is specific detail, like you can send a complaint to, you're stuck with that. Whereas if you give uh, an oversight type function to both the Commission and we have one already within our own Act, what you're doing is giving the flexibility to look at the things that you don't expect because you can't foresee what those issues are likely to be. The other fundamental thing in this is it opens the scrutiny of the system to a wider number of stakeholders. So you get different perspectives on the effectiveness of different things. Um, but I'll also pick up another point that Jim made about the Charter. And my understanding from talking to um, the government is that this is going to be co-production in sense. It should involve those that are going to use the service, um, citizens, um, which I think is a, a really good way of going uh, in terms of doing that. But the scrutiny of it actually is the really important thing because charters tend to be written in very broad terms, 
which is great and it's good, and they are very good in terms of principle. Um, but if we don't give ourselves reassurance at every level that those principles have translated into somebody getting their assistance in their bank account when they need it, then they're sort of empty words. So, yeah, I think really good that we have service complaints come to the SPSO, and I'm not just saying that because I'm the SPSO, I've got a really good team around me, and we are good at looking at these things. But I think for me, the fundamental thing beyond that is the ability to share intelligence and that it goes to a central place that can take holistic view and give effective feedback and reporting to both government and this committee. Thank you very much um, uh, for, for that answer um, and, and the clarity you've given about individual complaints and the, the sort of, I think, um, strategic oversight is the, the words Jim used, um, Dr McCormick used to describe um, the role of the Commission in this. Have you had any discussion about how that feedback loop would work? Would it be a relationship between yourselves and the Commission, yourselves and government, or do you see it being a a mixture, or is it just too early to have um, a, a conclusion in that at the moment? I think it's too early to have a conclusion, but I would come back to the point about less detail is probably better. I think it's, it's worth thinking about in terms of the legislation being the enabler rather than the instruction on what to do. So the enabler is effective information sharing. The enabler is the ability to raise issues at any point. The enabler is the powers to be able to bring things voluntarily, if I were the commission, to this committee. So my own personal approach would be to think of the legislation as the enabler, and that enabling framework then <coughs> It's the translation of it through the, the detailed regulations through the Charter that become the really important bit. So once those, those regulations are there, I, I said I wasn't going to comment on timescales and space and stuff, but this is a, as much a personal perspective. If, you want, if we want regulation to be right, we've, we've got to give it enough time to be scrutinised properly. I've, I've been lucky enough I think lucky is the right word, to come into um, work in, in environments that are legislatively bound. They work within a framework. And if the enabling framework and then the detail of it isn't carefully thought through and, and looked at by lots of different people, and that's the important, you get different comments of effectiveness of it in different ways, then you end up with something that you start doing workarounds with, which just makes it complicated for that person at the end point who just wants to say, please can I have some money? Um, Mr Tompkins, you wanted to come in? Good morning. Um, before, I, can I just ask a preliminary and technical legal question before we go any further? Given the way that the Scottish Government proposes to set up the Scottish Social Security Agency um, as you know, something which, within the administration, do we need an amendment to the SPSO Act to give you the jurisdiction to investigate complaints in relation to the agency, or is it already there because it's part of the government? Already there because we're part of the government. The right. amendment that I would suggest is not in relation to um, giving us the ability to look at complaints, but it's the specific um, ability to share information with the Commission. We don't need to add the agency in terms to the list of authorities in Schedule 2 to the Act in order to give you jurisdiction to investigate complaints? No. no. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, clearly your primary function, sorry? I, be I believe we would in order to look at complaints about the Commission. Oh, about the Commission? Yes, yes. not, not the about agency. the agency. <coughs> oh, sorry, I thought the question was about the agency. It, the question yeah. was about the agency, yeah, yes. thank you. But th thank you for that clarification, mm -hmm. that's also helpful. Um, so, clearly your primary function is to investigate complaints um, of injustice or hardship arising out of maladministration. What do you do if you have a series of related complaints about related injustice or related hardship arising out of related administration, related maladministration from the same agency or body? Um, 
I, I'm never convinced of the wisdom of saying I don't totally agree with something, but I don't totally agree with the assessment of complaints as our primary function. It is the one that everybody focuses on because it is the one that gets the most attention. But we equally um, have a responsibility for um, complaints handling uh, through the Complaint Standards Authority and the standards for complaints handling and the performance of it. And my, I feel very strongly about that element of our work as well. And what we do and are doing, and it is an area of our work that we are developing further, is we are improving our own internal intelligence gathering. And where we find that we have the same issues coming up with the same public body, we will raise it directly with them. Um, where we find that there is the same issue across a number of public bodies, we can use that information to inform and report in a different way. So we can use our reporting um, powers, so things like um, the report that was issued on informed consent. Where we also find specific types of things, we can share it, as I explained earlier, like the health stuff with Health Improvement Scotland. And ultimately, I can lay a, a report before Parliament on pretty much any issue I find out of complaints. But I think it's worth um, stressing that the best learning comes at the front line. So... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm just trying to understand. You, you, in your opening remarks, um, in response to the mm -hmm. convener's first question, um, you painted a picture as if, in your mind, there is a three-way distinction between oversight, complaints, and appeals, which will go to the tribunal. And, and I'm, w w I'm trying to understand exactly how mm -hmm. um, bright the line is between um, a really good ombudsman mm -hmm. who looks at complaints in the round and holistically yeah. and in a joined-up way and oversight, because it seems to me that what you've just said is that because you have the ability to lay special reports, to bring any matter at any time to the attention of Parliament, um, uh, you, because you have the ability, with great flexibility, much more flexible, much more, much more flexibility than courts and tribunals mm. have to roll complaints together so you look at them yeah. together rather than, you know, <coughs> severally and in a, any kind of, kind of mm. desiccated way, that, that that is precisely the oversight that we need. The, it is, and that's oversight of the complaints. There may be things on, that are related specifically to the Charter or the operation of the Act. And, and actually guidelines, you'd mentioned guidelines before. Now, we, we can raise those, and some of it is a matter of judgment about do we do our own report and submit it to Parliament because we think there is a, a really significant issue. And that may well be um, one route we take, and I would expect to consult with a range of stakeholders about that. Um, it may well be that what we have is information that we think is indicative of something, but is not conclusive enough. Although we may find three complaints on the same thing within you know, two months of each other, our own experience of complaints is the reality is that what reaches the ombudsman is, is very much the small proportion of what is really happening. So most complaints get resolved or addressed very early on. So by the time they reach us, what we have may not be truly representative. So we can choose to perhaps go and look into that further. We would talk to the organisations concerned. Where I think this and I don't think it's a, a clear line at this point, and it's different types of oversight and where it would be best to try and address the issues. If we find a particular organisation, then we're likely to tackle that one in the same way that we do now. You know, we found this consistently. How can we support you in getting it right, the point of delivery? Where we find something that perhaps is indicative of the underlying charter rather than an individual organisation, that is where I think that we um, would need to inv 
perhaps involve and report differently and share information with the Commission because they have a much wider remit in terms of what they're reporting to you and their relationship with ministers. Absolutely clear. Your, your evidence to us is that you already have the powers that you need to, um, to look at what um, Jim McCormick in the first session called patterns of maladministration. So if you, if you had a series of complaints, and I know it is driven by complaints, but if you had a series of complaints that revealed a pattern of injustice or a pattern of hardship arising out of a pattern of maladministration from a particular agency, in this instance, a social security agency, you have already all the powers you need to draw that to the attention of, the, to, of us, of, uh, of the Scottish Parliament, of the Scottish ministers, and indeed others. Yes, we thank do. you very much. Sorry, if we've answered the question, I think. But I, I think the, the, um, the important point to note is, as, as Rosemary says, we, we're dependent on the complaints that people choose to bring. And if you look at the health sector, for example, there are certain types of complaints that are far more emotive and far more likely to end up at our door. And so what we see is potentially slightly skewed depending on how emotive those complaints are and therefore what people choose to progress. So as Rosemary says, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. I would um, perhaps raise one other point about our powers, and it picks up on um, Nikki's point about we're reliant on the complaints people bring. Um, one of the things that we are talking to the government about separately in the moment is some extension to our powers in, that came through a, a different context, and it's about own initiative powers. Um, more consistent actually with the European Ombudsman model where we may come across issues that we don't have specific complaints about. Now some of those would be appropriate to take to the Commission but some of them, I, I think our Ombudsman service um, would be greatly enhanced if we were able to pick those up as well. Now I'm not saying it for this particular bill but at the moment between us, yes we do and on particular complaints and authorities, yes, we do. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, so an example you gave earlier, um, just to I suppose to kind of make it real for people, you said that um, you know, there'd be, there might be service issues where you know, uh, um, someone says, oh, I didn't get, didn't get my money on time, but what you said was that the wording of the charter <coughs> is key so I, I wrote that down when you said it because I, I thought that might be a quite critical point. So by that then, uh, just to kind of follow through that example, um, if an individual repeatedly, let's say, got late payments, the one the example that you gave, so they would have to rely on the charter in some way, would they, to bring the complaint forward? Because you said that the wording of the charter is key, and I just wanted to be clear about what, why you thought that was important. The, the complainer should not even need to, in a way, know the charter's there. Right. They don't have to refer to it. it. In the same way that somebody makes a complaint um, to us about health, they don't bring a complaint to us to say, oh, this particular hospital didn't comply with nice guidelines. They talk about their experience. Now, why the charter is key is the charter essentially is the framework within which I would expect an agency to write its policies and procedures and the way it is going to deliver its service. So the way the service is delivered is almost the translation of those rights and those principles. And it, yes, let's for argument's sake, there's something that said you have a right to be treated with respect and dignity, somebody coming to us to complain may not say, I wish to complain I wasn't treated with respect and dignity. It may be, they wouldn't answer my phone calls. So why the charter is key is we, I think as from a perspective of scrutiny, need to be able to um, see that it is embedded in the way the service is delivered so if you deliver your service well, then you have delivered that charter.
But then there is another side to why that charter is key, and that is in terms of the general principles and wider stakeholders um, who will understand what some of the issues are that individuals or groups of individuals have been through. The, the main thing for me is that um, there is enough between us in terms of oversight and scrutiny that if something is not working, that we can trace it back to that charter. It's almost like the genetic strand running through it all. <coughs> Thank you. Just finally, um, do you think there are resource implications if you, you take on this, it will, this, these additional complaints as a result of the creation of a new social security agency? Yes, is the short answer. Um, I think, uh, and you know, drawing on past experience and the experience that we we have between us, the resource implications are. It, it will come down to a combination of two things. It's the volume of complaints, and I think that that, to a large extent, um, we can do some analysis because the complaint side of it is less likely to be as prevalent as the appeals side. So I would say that we're likely to see more people appealing about the amount they've been um, awarded in assistance. So there's probably some um, way that we can look at national statistics to get a view of what that might look like and what that might translate into in terms of um, complaint investigation resources. The other resource implication is um, in John's team in terms of improvements and standards and um, engagement because if we find that there is something systemic that is perhaps going wrong, as Nikki, so we, we will raise this directly, but we do need the resource to do that. So we're not talking about huge... Um, additional resources. We're talking about perhaps one or two people, um, but it would be wrong to say there's no implication. My plea is that the resource is considered not just in terms of numbers of complaints, but in that value-adding work that is there to try and get it right first time for public bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions from committee members? Or you know, on that note then, uh, can I thank you very much for your attendance at committee this morning and um, we, we look forward to hearing more um, as we get through the bill process, I'm sure. Um, but thank you very much um, for coming at this stage. If you want to send them to us. And that, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. I will suspend shortly while we um, change over <coughs> to uh, witnesses.
Thank you. Um, our next evidence session is to um, take evidence from uh, Jean Freeman, Minister for Social Security, and we also welcome to committee this morning Chris Boyland from the Legislative Legislation Team Leader uh, and Anne McVie, Deputy Director of Social Security Policy at the Scottish Government. And a uh, very warm welcome to committee this morning. I um, understand you've got an opening statement for us, Minister. I have, Convener. Thank you very much. And as always, um, good morning to you and to members, and my thanks for the opportunity to uh, be with you this morning. Um, I'd like to begin, if I may, by placing on record my particular thanks to all those involved with the Short Life Expert Working Group uh, and those who assisted them, who produced a very thorough report, uh, which I know you've spent some time looking at this morning, on the scrutiny of devolved social security arrangements and did so in a very short space of time. With the benefit of their considerations and our own reflections, we, I think, have now moved on. Last Wednesday, the Scottish Government laid amendments, some of which, in my view, provide a carefully considered, clear and comprehensive response both to this committee's recommendations at the end of stage one on scrutiny and to the recommendations of the working group. The amendments were lodged after careful consideration of all of the ed evidence provided during the stage one process and also the extensive consultation that has been undertaken to date. They deliver on the commitments I made in relation to scrutiny and the super affirmative pro procedure, both when I appeared before this committee on the 2nd of November, uh, November and during the stage one debate on the 19th of December. These amendments demonstrate the Scottish Government has listened to the concern of stakeholders, the working group and the committee, and that we've made the improvements people wanted us to make where they are consistent with our social security principles. We propose, as you will know, to set up an independent scrutiny body to strengthen protections around the Charter, to allow people to seek redress when they feel that the commitments set out in the Charter have not been kept, and to apply an enhanced level of parliamentary scrutiny to regulations made under the Bill. I'd like to say just a little bit more about each of these in turn. Amendments 15 to 17 give clear and unequivocal effect to the Scottish Government's commitment to introduce a statutory independent scrutiny body to be called the Scottish Commission on Social Security. They also address feedback and concerns raised by a wide range of stakeholders. Amendment 16 makes provision for the establishment of SCOS. We're proposing that it should have a chair and two to four members. Members would be appointed by ministers subject to the need to ensure that the body has the right mix of knowledge and expertise including knowledge of the effects of disability arising from a physical or mental impairment. SCOS will have specific functions and ministers will also be able to confer additional functions to the body by regulations. As well as scrutinising regulations, the body will also have other functions to prepare reports on any matter that either ministers or parliament suggest and to prepare reports on whether the system as a whole is delivering on the expectations set out in the Charter. This last function is particularly important because it means that stakeholders, such as welfare rights advisors, who support and advise people using the system, will be able to refer evidence to SCOS where they believe that the system is falling short of the Charter. Amendment 13 further strengthens pr protections around the Social Security Charter by placing an ad additional duty on Scottish ministers to consult the scrutiny body on any proposed changes. This would enable the scrutiny body to highlight any concerns to both ministers and to the parliament prior to any changes. I think it also fits well with the other duties we are proposing the body should carry out. In addition, these amendments also provide that when carrying out its functions, the uh, Scottish Commission on Social Security must have regard to relevant human rights instruments and in the case of scrutinising proposals for regulations to the social security principles. Giving SCOS an ongoing role in assessing whether components of the system, such as future regulations, as well as the wider system as a whole, deliver on the requirements of human rights instruments will help ensure that these are taken into account. Amendment 18 addresses a question which was raised during stage one 
as to whether the rights to be set out in the Charter can only be meaningful if individuals are able to seek redress where those rights have been breached. Many stakeholders supported this view, including uh, EHCR, uh, Scottish Human Rights Commission, CPAG, uh, CAS and HIV Scotland. As individual redress implies casework, the Scottish Government believes that this should be a separate and distinct function to the strategic oversight role that the Scottish Commission on Social Security would have, and therefore should be undertaken by a separate body. So Amendment 18 provides for Ministers to specify more detail in regulations, including which body should undertake the function of handling and investigating such complaints. This is for purely pragmatic reasons. Discussions with relevant parties continue, and my officials and I, as I think the committee have heard, uh, have had very helpful discussions with the Ombudsman and her colleagues, just as I'm sure, as I've said, you have had today. But it will still take time to make arrangements with the appropriate body and to then work with them to agree the detail of how this function would work in practice. Amendments 55 and 56 fulfil our commitment to apply an enhanced level of parliamentary scrutiny to regulations made under Part 2, Chapter 2, Section 45 of the Bill. They introduce requirements on ministers to publish proposals for regulations, refer their proposals to SCOS and notify Parliament that they have done so. Once it has considered ministers' proposals, the Commission must prepare and publish a report taking into account social security principles and any relevant international human rights instruments. Ministers then have a duty to provide a response to that report, which should be submitted to Parliament when the draft regulations are laid. In making their response, ministers must set out where the regulations differ from the report and why, explain what they have done to address any recommendations made in the Commission report, and say if they disagree with any of the report's conclusions, and if they do, explain why. I think if you look at them together with amendments 15 to 17, which establish the Commission, then I hope the Committee will agree that these pro proposals provide the enhanced levels of scrutiny required, whilst addressing concerns that the balance between primary and secondary legislation is properly struck. Uh, convener, I trust that after hearing what I've had to say this morning, as well as having the written summary of our amendments, the committee will be able to agree that our proposals address the seven primary recommendations set out in the Working Group's report. I am, of course, more than happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, can I bring in Pauline <coughs> McNeill? Thank you. Um, good morning, Minister. Um, the, the questions I have for you this morning relate to the... Um, the role of the Parliament and the Committee in relation to scrutiny. Um, so we had a very good first panel, the, the expert panel, um, outline, um, I think, some issues in relation to the, the, the sequencing of where the scrutiny and the order of scrutiny comes in in relation to the Commission, um, the Minister's reply and the Committee. And what I've heard so far um, it appears to me that some of that still needs to be sorted out. Um, it appears as though the committee has no statutory role until the draft regulations are laid where they can no longer be amended. And it would give control of the process for enhanced scrutiny to the commission. Um, I just wondered what your rationale was for the Commission setting out the proposed superimitive rather than it being defined in statute, and are you, would you be satisfied that that would give um, due, uh, allow for the, for the committees of the Parliament to do its job in scrutinising the regulations? Well, of course. Um, what happens is that the um, Scottish Government, in preparing draft regulations, uh, would obviously consult in order to do so. It then passes those regu draft regulations to the Commission and publishes them at the same time, uh, informing uh, this committee or whatever is the appropriate committee of Parliament at that time that it has done so. Um, the Commission thereafter has a job to uh, do. The Commission can choose itself to consult uh, on those regulations and take views, uh, as indeed can this committee choose to do that. 
Uh, and we then have the, co the Commission's conclusions on what government is proposing uh, and government's response to those. Uh, and then government would lay uh, draft regulations for Parliament to determine. So there is, in my view, uh, room to ensure that uh, there is sufficient time for consultation and the, the role of committees in the Parliament, uh, that they take the role that they believe is appropriate for them. It's not for me to tell committees what to do. Uh, I had the benefit of listening to most of your evidence this morning, um, and I think the point that I believe Dr McCormick made about creating uh, proper time and space uh, for that uh, to take place was a point well made. But, but in view of that, do you not think it should be clearer set out in statute? I mean, what would concern me is that, that well, so the committee can consult and the commission can choose to consult or not. It may choose not to consult. But the committee, how does the committee then affect the, the, the regulations that are already laid because it can't amend them? Well, of course, the committee can ask the commission to undertake work on the committee's behalf. And I see no reason thinking about the amendment that we've proposed as we have worded it, why the committee, or a committee of the parliament cannot ask the commission to engage with it in its consultation and consideration of the draft regulations. But it still remains the fact that the committee cannot amend the regulations once they are laid, is that the case? Well, that's the nature, as I understand it, of the affirmative procedure. Thank you. Um, Mr. Balfour? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Minister. I mean, I mean, I think where I'm still slightly confused is in regard to um, the government lays um, its draft um, regulations down. The Commission seems to be happy with them and doesn't want to take any evidence, but the committee isn't happy with them. And the commission say, no, we don't want to carry out an investigation. At that point, I see no room for this committee or any other committee to then say, we want to carry out a public consultation on this. And I think what I'm, I'm a bit confused on <coughs> is in regard to the time scale. So, if, if the Commission come and say, we're happy with these regulations, we don't need to do any public consultation, and the committee, this committee or any other committee says, no, actually, we do. As it stands, my reading would be that this committee couldn't stop the government then laying the um, regulations for either approval or not approval. No, this, this committee could not stop government laying regulations. Um, However, this committee could oppose those regulations and Parliament we, would yeah, vote against them. Yeah. So we're, we're talking, right, we're I, talking I, I, about but, 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 an affirmative but, but, procedure. Yeah, I suppose the point of what I'm trying to get Minister is that there's no room for this committee to take evidence if the government wants to push ahead with these regulations. Only the Commission can take evidence. Uh -huh. So if, if we compare it to uh, how things might stand currently, we are establishing a Commission where ministers have a statutory obligation to consult that commission on changes that they want to make or new proposals they want to introduce. A statutory obligation. The commission then, as it should do as an independent body, takes a view on how it wants to respond to that consultation. But its response has to come and be laid before the parliament at the same time as the government lays the regulations. Now, they may lay regulations at that point that are different from the draft regulations because they have listened to what people have said and changed them, or they may not. And they have to explain uh, either where they have changed them and why from the original initial draft uh, or why they have not. Um, at that point, there are draft regulations before Parliament and Parliament uh, with the affirmative procedure either supports them or not. Now, if this committee wants uh, an additional role in that matter, then um, it, it is for the committee to decide what role that might be. I'm sure members will recall, I think as far back as June 
last year, I raised with the committee the idea of scrutiny and super affirmative and asked the committee to um, give me the benefit of their views. If you now have views on that matter, then I'm very happy to hear them. But can I just clarify, just absolutely for the record, that as the, regular, as, as the amendments that you've put forward at the moment stand, this committee cannot carry out an independent um, inquiry into the regulations unless the Commission approve that? Well, it's not, it's, uh, it's not for me to determine what this committee no, chooses to do. No, there don't is have nothing, Mr Balfour, there is nothing <coughs> in the amendment that prevents this committee from doing such a thing should it wish to. So I'm not preventing it. I'm simply not including it in my amendment. Partly, I think, because it really isn't for Scottish Government to tell committees of this Parliament how to conduct their business. So, for the record, I am not preventing that, or vetoing it, or blocking it. I am not uh, enabling it, because I do not believe it is for Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers to tell committees of this Parliament how to conduct their business. I think that's clear. I suppose, I mean, a supplementary, I wanted to ask a different question, but a supplementary on that. Um, well, there are other members, I'll come back to the new question, but if you do have a supplementary... I, mean, so, mm -hmm. I fully understand, Minister, that you're not preventing, blocking or vetoing it. But uh, the concern that I think Pauline McNeill and Jeremy Balfour have tried to uh, express to you is, that, is a practical concern about whether this committee, in fact, will have time to do that, given the nature of the process. It's not a question of whether we need the Scottish ministers to enable it. It's a question of whether in practice, in fact, there's going to be the, the, the time physically to enable us to, you know, um, assemble evidence, take evidence, consider evidence, report on evidence before Parliament has to make a yay or nay decision about whether it wants to, to, to vote for the, the regulations or not. I think that's the concern. Okay, so, so I think there are two, well, there's more than two parts to, to, the an, to the answer of the question of time. There is what we have to do um, in terms of this parliamentary term, where we will have a number of regulations under each of the benefit headings to bring forward. And we will need to uh, discuss with you uh, how we do that in order to ensure maximum time for the committee to take whatever steps it wishes to take. Uh, and also, um, we are obviously should the committee and indeed the parliament agree with the amendment to establish the commission as we've outlined then we have to establish the commission so in the in the lifetime of this parliament if you like there needs to be a degree of um, flexibility and discussion around um, the kind of space and time that dr mccormick was referring to given the overall constraints in that we've all got three years before the next set of elections um, thereafter though um, in terms of time, as I understand the way the process works, um, part of um, uh, setting the business of the Parliament is a matter for our respective parties' business managers to agree when issues are tabled for uh, vote. And should uh, business managers from parties in this committee uh, hear from members on this committee that the timetabling of a vote on regulations from government was too short to allow the committee to do the work that it believed it should do, then there would be an argument and a debate in that body about when the regulations were laid for the vote by government. Thank you. Uh, Mr Griffin? Oh, it's been answered, thank you. Very quick supplementary. Very quick supplementary. <laughs> Apologies for that. I just think this is not fully examined. I, I just wondered, the point you make, Minister, is that it's open to the committee to consult on the... Once they know their... They see the draft regulations, they can choose to consult at that point in trying to influence the process. But, I mean, the, the analysis that we have from SPICE is quite clear, is that the scrutiny process at the moment is in the hands of the Commission. We do not make sense to ensure that in the process that there was adequate time and something written into the legislation to ensure that the committee has time to consult on the draft regulations because otherwise what will happen is that the regulations will be 
laid in their final form, and it will be all or nothing. We'll have to accept if there's something in it and we haven't influenced it. I, I wouldn't myself presume that members of this committee, individually and collectively, were uh, so quiet that they would allow such a thing to happen and so unassertive. Uh, I think committee is perfectly capable of exercising its views and deciding how it wants to proceed. Uh, in terms of setting time limits, there is a, a, just a straightforward practical difficulty with this in that some of the regulations may not require uh, a significant amount of time and others most definitely do uh, in terms of uh, who requires to be consulted and who they would impact on. So I'm not sure how I, we could reasonably set some kind of time limit on this matter. But of course, if members of the committee have a view, uh, as I asked in June last year, then I'm very happy to hear that view. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you wanted to? Um, thank you for your... uh, I'd just be interested to understand how proactive you think the Commission might be. D do you imagine that it could look into any aspect of social security in Scotland that, that it might wish. Obviously, that's dictated to by some extent with regards to its capacity and resource, <coughs> or do you see it purely as reacting to instruction from the committee and or the parliament? No, I, I think the amendment is clear that um, in addition to responding to what Scottish ministers and the parliament may require it to do in meeting uh, its functions in terms of regulations, the Commission uh, has the opportunity uh, to consider uh, other matters that it believes are relevant to the operation of Social Security in Scotland. Okay. So it is for the Commission to, uh, to determine. We, we are very clear in this amendment, this is an independent body. Uh, it is a corporate body. It will be responsible in those matters uh, for its, its own operation and running. And we've taken steps, I think, to ensure its independence. So uh, given uh, how the amendment is set out, then it clearly has a job to do uh, with respect to regulations and other matters, but it, it also um, has uh, the powers to respond to issues that Scot either Scottish ministers or uh, Parliament raise with it and ask it to look at, as well as to initiate that for itself. And as we heard, I think you heard earlier from the Ombudsman, then there is clearly an important role between the Commission and the Ombudsman uh, in terms of, of uh, looking at uh, information and evidence uh, in terms of any uh, systemic uh, matters related to the operation of Social Security. The, I think the list of members of the UK Social Security Committee are you know, I suppose we're looking for a, a commission that is capable of independent thought and uh, challenging views. Um, is that something that, that we're aspiring to hear? How will we ensure that we've got that right mix? Because it is quite a small commission. You know, this, is, this is a lot of work for a small group of people. How will we make sure we've got the correct people in that role? Um, well, I, I'm not sure I, I necessarily agree that it is uh, too small. Um, I think um, in setting out the amendment, uh, I wanted to ensure that it was large enough to secure some of the breadth of expertise that is absolutely required, uh, but not so large that um, it, uh, it, it cannot function um, as effectively and quickly as, as it might want to do from time to time. Um, I think that the Commission will have the capacity uh, to ensure that where it needs additional expertise, it can bring that in to its considerations. Uh, and that may be, for example, in terms of what I consider to be the very important element of our amendment, which is a requirement on the Commission to consider compliance with human rights instruments. I think that is a very important distinction from what currently exists. Uh, and an important follow-through on our commitment to that in primary legislation for the system as a whole. Um, now, clearly, the, the Commission may uh, have as one of its members an individual with expertise in that area, but it may not, and so it would be expected to bring that in to assist it. Um, I'd also uh, hope that the uh, Commission will 
uh, and will be able to form the uh, productive relationship with the uh, body that will continue to look after social security in England and Wales uh, in order to ensure that what any government here brings forward um, uh, fits with the um, delivery and the uh, implications of social, social security uh, legislation for England and Wales. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Mr Tompkins? Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, I haven't got your amendments in front of me, Minister, so I can't remember what number it is, but there's an amendment, and you referred to it in your opening remarks, that um, would confer on you the power to make by regulations um, uh, anybody unspecified responsible for oversight of the Charter. What, what, what's, what's going on there? That, th that, seems, that, that seems to me to be a very, very odd amendment indeed, um, particularly what we, given what we just heard from the Ombudsman, which is, one, that the Ombudsman already has the power to investigate complaints with regard to the agency because of the way in which you're proposing to set the agency up as part of the Scottish Government, um, and, uh, and two, that the Ombudsman has the power she said she has all the powers that she needs um, to roll complaints together so, so that she can, so that she can um, look at issues um, uh, systemically rather than just you know, um, uh, individual complaint by individual complaint. So wh why do we need that amendment at all when the Ombudsman already has those powers? Do you know the amendment I'm talking about? Is it, is it, are you referring to, I'm going to read it, right? Because yeah. uh, if, if you don't have it, there's no point in me giving you the number. Um, it says, uh, it's under the heading Charter-Based Complaints, it says, Scottish Ministers are to make regulations conferring on a person the function described in... It's, yeah. it's that. Um, uh, I think, it, given uh, the, the most recent discussions we've had with the Ombudsman, and given the uh, evidence that she uh, gave this morning in terms of their powers uh, and their role, uh, then I, I think we need to reflect on that amendment again uh, and, about that. <laughs> and uh, uh, understand whether or not it is something we want to press yeah. or whether we okay. uh, want to right, move thanks. on it. Um, I should just say that um, it may be uh, helpful for the committee to know. I know that the Ombudsman this morning um, placed uh, significant uh, emphasis on the Charter and the importance of the Charter, as indeed do we, and I think gave a, a very helpful uh, clarity to the explanation about the, why the Charter is so important. Um, she also made, I think, to this committee, as she has done in my conversations with her, the importance of how the Charter is worded uh, and of um, securing, as we've always said, uh, wording in the Charter, hence the importance of co-production, that is understandable and accessible, uh, but at the same time is worded in a way that provides the foundation from which the Ombudsman would then conduct any work is appropriate for them to conduct. So in that regard, I um, have uh, made a request of the Ombudsman and I'm delighted that she's agreed to act as our critical friend as we go through the process of the um, iterative co-production of the Charter. Can I, can I ask, uh, on, on that note, Minister, um, what you see the importance of the annual report in the Charter and the five-year review, given that we are setting up this system from scratch? <coughs> well, I, I, think, um, I think, as was said earlier this morning, that um, nothing is ever perfect from the outset. Uh, I think it was also said that it's always uh, sensible at the outset to... Um, uh, roll back a little on the detail uh, and uh, engage in the practice. So I think the uh, reporting uh, process allows us to, and allows the system uh, and uh, ministers, parliament, others, to uh, see how it works in practice, continue to take views about uh, where it, there is room for improvement, uh, and then uh, make those necessary improvements. And I think the timeframes we set uh, by and large, makes sense in terms of, of giving something time uh, to work, uh, but also not leaving it too long before you introduce improvements that the working of it in that first period uh, demonstrate are clearly needed. Thank you. Uh, Mr Griffin, you wanted to... Thank you, Camina. I had a 
couple of points that arose from our first panel um, with Jim McCormick and Ju Judith Patterson. Um, the first one was um, around the ministerial power to lay draft regulations before the Commission has um, produced their report. Um, I think um, witnesses' views of it from the first panel were that it's not as it's not as bad as the system in place as the UK government, but it doesn't seem quite like a ringing endorsement of it. Um, so just to ask uh, why uh, you feel the need to retain that power. And the other question was um, around um, guidance and what role the, the Commission would have in scrutinising ministerial guidance. Um, uh, yes, I, I had the benefit of hearing that myself this morning. Um, I, I am happy to say um, unequivocally, I think, that what we're proposing is um, more than significantly better than the current situation. Um, so I'm happy to have that conversation with uh, others. Uh, the point I think that was being referred to was in uh, 55, it was 7B. Uh, and the rationale for that is, so our, our uh, thinking here is that when we uh, ask the Commission to look at draft regulations, uh, we would, depending on uh, the size and the degree of detail in, in the regulations, uh, look to reach an agreement with the Commission about uh, how long they need to do the job that they're being asked to do. Uh, and that obviously feeds back into some of the discussions earlier about uh, space and time. Um, but it may well be the case that the um, Commission, uh, despite having has reached an agreement that it, they have six weeks, they have eight weeks, whatever it might be, uh, to respond and produce their report, that that is uh, not met uh, and that Scottish ministers feel that the draft regulations are of such import that they require to lay them, even though the Commission has not met the agreed time frame to respond. And that's why 7B is there. On your second point on guidance, um, I, I had the benefit of hearing uh, what the Ombudsman said uh, with uh, guidance uh, and, uh, and indeed, um, I, th I think it was um, Ms Patterson too, uh, I think it is fair um, to consider whether there is uh, uh, something in terms of proportionate scrutiny of guidance. I think the point was well made about there can be a great deal of guidance produced. I, I don't imagine we intend to replicate the GWP's approach on guidance, but um, there will be guide, some guidance that, that does not require significant scrutiny, and there may be others, and I'm happy to reflect on what was said on that. Okay, thanks for that. On the, the first point, and the Minister will be able to give the committee a reassurance that it would only be exceptional circumstances that that power to lay those draft regulations would ever be used before the Commission table report? I, I am absolutely uh, able to give that reassurance. I'm sure the member will recall that it came from Scottish ministers, the idea that uh, all ministers would be required to consult an independent scrutiny body before it, they laid regulations before Parliament. So, of course, I see that as um, an exceptional matter when that wouldn't happen. Thank you. Uh, Mr Adam. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. Uh, I was wanting to ask about was Rosemary Agnew's uh, evidence. I found some of it quite compelling in some, the fact that she was saying the Charter was almost heart and soul of the whole uh, ideal. But unlike some of the things that we've been discussing beforehand, she said it's not important if the individual doesn't know it verbatim. It's more about delivery. And I, I found that quite compelling because, to me, that's what the whole process is about. It's about the individual. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that whole idea because is that not... It is as simple as that. It's about making sure people get paid on time and the money when they need it, you know. So, really, is, is that not... Although we've got to go through the technical issues, is it not the whole point that it's down to the individual at the end of the day? I, I agree. Um, I, I, too, have found... Um, my discussions with Ms Agnew compelling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm very appreciative of the importance that she attaches to the Charter in terms of how the Ombudsman would do, uh, fulfil their role mm -hmm. uh, in terms of social security. Uh, 
And whilst <clears throat> I am very keen that the Charter is written in language that is genuinely accessible and able to be understood, um, I, I am also appreciative of the view expressed from the Ombudsman that an individual does not need to go to the Ombudsman to, and say, my rights have not been met in order for the Ombudsman to then act. They can simply be saying, this is what happened to me. Mm. And I've exhausted the agency's complaints process and I, I still haven't got anywhere. This is what happened to me. And that may be, the individual may have received uh, uh, their entitlement uh, that they were due and at a level that they are content with. So they may have the benefit, but still feel that the manner in which they were dealt with was poor, uh, and that's what they now want redress on, and that is what the Ombudsman would then respond to by looking at, as I understand it, what the individual describes has happened, what the agency has to say about that, and how that sits with what the Charter requires by way of the agency's behaviour, uh, and then reach a view. And I think that is very helpful. Okay, just to go on to another point as well, is uh, there, in the first session there was uh, hints at uh, almost a stage where, you know, from, from some of my colleagues, that uh, the Commission and yourself would become so powerful that uh, you, we wouldn't actually get a look in with regards to the committee. Now, I know we mentioned it a bit earlier on, but just for the record and just to continue on it, you know, th the whole point would be for the committee to proactively take a view forward, and that's how this place works. You know, it's up to the individuals, and it's up to our, uh, the MSPs to uh, bring these things forward. So this is just normal. This is just a normal way of doing business. Surely, you know, this is uh, the case when it comes to this scenario. That's, I think that's absolutely right. That is how this place works. And um, at, at the end of the day, the most powerful body here is the parliament, um, because it will be the parliament that says yes or no to regulations that are laid before it. And um, it is as entitled to say no as it is to say yes. I think we've had this discussion on this committee before where I've said it would be, in my view, a daft government that comes forward with regulations where <clears throat> the Commission has been critical of them, has not listened to that, the committee is critical, but nonetheless presses ahead. Then that government should reasonably expect to lose. With regards to the fact <clears throat> that, you know, it's a parliament of minorities, uh, and also you have the scenario where, you know, as you quite rightly said, there is a process for business managers to go through business. So there is checks and balances all the way across the process. I, I think that's correct. Are there any further questions from committee members? No, uh, on that note then, can I thank you very much, Minister, for your attendance this morning? And we'll suspend and go into private session now. Thank you.